Welcome to Uncovering Trust, a podcast by the Edison Group, a content-led IR business integrating analyst content, digital targeting, and investor engagement. Each episode, we'll uncover the distinct features and latest developments of a selected investment company. Tune in to find interesting investment ideas and to stay on top of what's happening in the investment company sector. I'm your host, Neil Shah, Director of Content and Strategy, and today I am joined by Milos Paps, Director of Investment Trust Content at the Edison Group. Who will be talking about HG Capital Trust or HGT. Milos, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So please can you start by uh, providing a high level introduction to HGT uh, for those listeners who are less familiar with the fund? Sure. Um, HGT invests in leading profitable unquoted European mid-market businesses with an international footprint offering uh, mission critical low spend software solutions to SMEs. It currently holds a portfolio of close to 50 such holdings and provides high quality exposure to the corporate digitalization trend. HG Sweet Spot lies in the defensive tech growth companies operating in one of eight core end markets, um, tax and accounting, ERP and payroll, legal and compliance, automation and engineering, insurance, SME tech services, capital markets and wealth management IT, and finally healthcare IT. Now, I believe you call the trust the king of dull tech in one of your research notes. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, the tech subsectors HGT invests in may not sound as exciting as AI, which, by the way, HG uses to drive operational improvement of portfolio companies or the metaverse, for instance. Uh, the trust does not invest in anything you know, glamorous or, and, and there are no consumer brands in its portfolio. That said, uh, its portfolio holdings benefit from a strong secular trend and offer a combination of a high share of recurring revenues based on software as a service subscription models and high customer retention. Uh, AGT has historically delivered revenue and EBITDA growth of around 20 to 30% per annum at a margin above 25% across its top 20 holdings. Uh, therefore, it fulfills the so-called rule of 40, which is a kind of a rule of a thumb, but based on empirical evidence saying that software stocks with combined revenue growth and EBITDA margins of 40% or more typically generate higher valuations. Uh, we have discussed this in um, our, research, our research note published in June last year. So there is nothing dull about the business prospect of HGT's portfolio companies or its returns. Thanks, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, so how does HGT compare with some of the other listed private equity companies on the one hand and listed technology trusts on the other hand? HDT is a listed private equity trust, uh, but I believe it should not be looked only through that lens, but should also be considered a potential component of an investor's broader tech exposure. Uh, this is because many tech trusts or ETFs have their portfolios skewed to US big tech or you know, the Magnificent Seven as they are being called these days. Uh, it is also worth noting that the listed European software tech opportunity set is contracting due to M&A and take private transactions, for example, Aviva or Microfocus. Finally, better access to private capital means that companies across regions do not need to list to raise the funds uh, required to drive growth. As a result, companies can stay private for longer, and this allows private equity investors such as HGT to retain far more of the value created by these companies. And, and from what I understand, as a private equity manager, HG also actively contributes to the value creation process. Correct. Um, HG's vast tech expertise and value creation capabilities means that it may be perceived um, as a sort of a tech conglomerate in an investment company wrapper. This comes from a combination of three strengths. Firstly, its in-house team of operational experts, which includes more than 50 senior operational specialists, um, each supported by a network of trusted third-party associates and partners. Secondly, uh, an extensive community consisting of key managers from its portfolio companies called, e called HD Hive. And thirdly, um, intellectual property, tools, and group services on which its portfolio companies can rely. Okay, um, but as a tech conglomerate um, doesn't have a, a tech conglomerate doesn't have a predefined holding period for its businesses like a private equity fund. So uh, what's HGT's approach here? Yes, that's a fair point. However, while HGT makes new investments and exits each year, um, so constantly refreshing its portfolio and generating cash flow from realization proceeds, it can also run winners for longer. This is thanks to a tiered suite of private funds managed by HG, which HGT invests through, 
covering the small cap Mercury funds, the mid cap Genesis funds, and the large cap Saturn funds. A portfolio holding can therefore move up the fund structure as it grows. Mm -hmm. Um, examples of companies which were held by G funds for more than the usual private equity holding period of you know, around three to five years are Visma, a provider of mission critical business software to SMEs and the public sector in the Benelux and Nordic regions, and Access Group, a provider of ERP and payroll solutions. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so you got longevity. Now, can you uh, tell us anything about the main drivers about? For the returns generated by the trust, what are the contributions of the operational improvements fostered by HG? Mm -hmm. uh, let me start by highlighting that the trust's focus on software and tech-enabled services companies uh, provided, uh, well, sorry, proved very beneficial to the trust's returns relative to other listed P companies um, over the mid to long term horizon. The trust has also outperformed several of the UK listed tech trusts over the last five years, um, though it was somewhat behind some of them over 10 years, which I believe was at least partly due to the stellar performance of big tech names to which several of the peers have had meaningful exposure. Um, that said, investors should probably ask themselves the question if they want to exclusively bet on these names, which well have become a quite crowded trade, or hold a more diverse tech portfolio. Um, coming back to your question on the return attribution, um, HG's 20-year gross IRR to end 2022 stood at a healthy 33%. Uh, software sector growth combined with HG's focus on strong players within selected clusters and positive operating leverage effects were the main contributor with around 15 percentage points, so close to half of the returns, um, according to HG. The trust's average portfolio leverage is likely higher than the average gearing across a listed tech portfolio, uh, which is an inherent feature of most listed private equity trusts. Uh, therefore, financing leverage added a further seven percentage points, so roughly one-fifth, to HG, uh, HG's returns. Um, HG's operating skills and M&A, that is buy and build strategy, were also important contributors with five percentage points and six percentage points, respectively. Okay, that's good. Then. So we've got the attribution. Now, uh, the question that comes to mind is what extent is the market for business to business services offered by HG's portfolio companies already saturated? Would a, a new investor in the trust be late to the game? Um, yeah, this is a valid question, given that the trust portfolio has benefit, benefited from the structural trend towards digitalization for many years now, which accelerated since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that said, HG's head of research recently examined IT spending patterns across countries and found that the share of software spending grows with the level of overall IT spending as a percentage of GDP. This suggests that the sector is not approaching saturation even in the more de developed economies. Um, I believe this is first because even companies which have adopted one or more software as a service solution um, still have many more pieces of software that they otherwise have to buy or license upfront that could alternatively be delivered via the cloud, allowing them to be paid for as they are used and kept constantly updated. Um, moreover, more and more businesses, business processes are being automated across an expanding range of industries. Yeah, and has the trend remained strong in the recent inflation environment as well? Um, in general, enterprises are likely to prioritize spending on software as a service to capture competitive advantages through increased productivity, automation, and other software-driven transformation initiatives. Demand for IT services should be supported by investments in organizational efficiency and optimization projects. Uh, these me measures are aimed at offsetting the white-collar wage inflation and other cost inflation, among other things, so they play nicely into the inflationary environment. Um, according to Gartner's forecasts released in January, uh, global software and IT services spending will grow by 12.7% and 8.7% in 2024, respectively. Uh, that said, HG has seen some pressure on sales to new customers as they become more reluctant to commit to new software and services in the challenging macro environment. Uh, however, this has been at least partly offset by cross and upselling to existing customers. This, together with bolt-on acquisitions, resulted in strong revenue and EBITDA growth of 25 and 28% in 2023, respectively. Uh, this was achieved at a solid EBITDA margin, which over the 12 months to end September 2023 reached um, 30%. Okay. And uh, how about the trust portfolio valuations and realizations during the different macro environment in uh, 2022 and 23? It's good that you bring this up. Um, first, it is important to underline the trust's 
um, <clears throat> strong long-term track record of realizing investments above previous carrying value. Between 2017 and 2022, for instance, the average uplift to carrying value at the end of the preceding year stood at 38%. Furthermore, there has been no disposal below previous carrying value across the trust portfolio over the last 10 years. HD normally uh, underwrites a multiples contraction when acquiring its platform investments, so companies forming the base of a buy and build strategy. But actually, the contraction did not materialize to a meaningful extent in the past. Even in the more demanding environment in 2022 and 2023, uh, marked by low deal activity and pressure from higher interest rates, uh, the trust was able to realize investments above previous carrying value. In 2023, the average uplift and 2022 carrying values was uh, well robust at 25%. While the trust's exit activity was quite muted in the first half of 2023, it picked up subsequently, bringing its total proceeds from realizations and refinancing to £343 million in 2023. This includes £109 million from the full exit of the cloud-based transportation management software platform Transporion, at an uplift of 18% to the last carrying value, and 22 million from the full exit of Comify, a business messaging solutions provider to local enterprises at a 32% uplift to the end March 2023 carrying value. HGT's ability to deliver meaningful liquidity events in the tough environment should be put in the context of the decline in the global PE exit activity last year, which was down around 66% from the 2021 peak. Um, HGT has announced four further transactions in December 2023 and January this year, which HG expects to generate around £295 million of proceeds to HGT upon closure in 2024, though some of these proceeds will be reinvested in the same businesses. Uh, these include the onboarding of new investors into Visma through the HG Saturn funds, the full exit from GGW Group, which um, with, with part of the proceeds to be reinvested in the business, um, the partial realization of IRIS, uh, generating net proceeds of £42 million to HGT, and the full exit from Argos Media. We know, well, I would say that the GGW Group and Argos Media exits um, value the businesses at a 40% and 7% uplift to the end September 2023 carrying value, respectively. Um, the Iris deal values the business in line with the end September carrying value, but uh, around 14% above the end 2022 carrying value. I believe that these realizations and the recently announced deals are a testament to the quality of the trust portfolio and its conservative valuation approach. Okay. Um, so in light of the sort of interest rate environment, can you shed some light on the impact of higher rates on the listed private equity trusts uh, such as HGT? Uh, sure. Um, HGT's average net debt to EBITDA across its top 20 holdings stood at 7.4 times um, at the end of September 2023. While this may look high in absolute terms at first glance, uh, it is worth keeping in mind a couple of things. Firstly, AGT's net debt as a proportion of its overall capital structure is less than 30%. Um, secondly, its businesses display high earnings growth, around half of which comes from organic growth, while the net debt to EBITDA ratio I've just mentioned is based on last 12 month earnings. Finally, the underlying businesses are highly cash generative, which often allows for well, relatively swift deleveraging if necessary. Um, interest on 75% of the debt is hedged for two years on average, and most of the debt is not coming due until 2027 to 2029. Uh, during last year's Capital Markets Day, HG highlighted that uh, higher interest rates may reduce its prospective gross IRR by around 3 to 4 percentage points from the 33% IRR I mentioned before. So this still leaves a strong return generation potential. Melos, thank you very much. I mean, I think you've given us a great perspective on HG and you know, why dull takes actually really interesting to take a look at. Um, you've been listening to Uncovering Trusts, a podcast by the Edison Group. If you want to find out more about HGT and other investment companies we cover, please visit www.edisongroup.com. Thank you. 